Welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our call for COVID-19 health rounds. And today we will be discussing tackling community spread, surveillance and control strategies. Uh, before we actually go into our agenda and before we actually discuss what we're going to, to have our presenters discuss this afternoon, I'd like to bring to, you, to your attention and, and make this statement for our media personnel and persons within our midst. Permission required for use of information. It is my duty and responsibility to remind everyone of the ground rules and the reason that we come together in these sessions and that it is to support CARFA's member states and partners with the knowledge and tools they need to effectively respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. So during these sessions, we ask that if there are members of the media online, or if you would like to take the participants' views or slides and publish them, that you first contact CARFA and we will connect you to the speakers in order to clear that with them. Thank you everyone for complying. I'm your moderator, Angela Hines, and I'm Senior Technical Officer at the, at the HCE Department at CARFA. And I welcome you all here today. Today we have a packed agenda and we have some special guests, but we will, but here I have a, the agenda and I'm showing you that we will first start with special greetings from Dr. Indah, and then we will have a presentation from Dr. Fletcher Lati of CARFA. Next, Dr. Cheryl Jones, also of CAFA. And then we have our feature guests, Dr. Parasaram, CMO, Trinidad and Tobago, and Dr. Singh, CMO of Guyana, after which we'll have a Q&A session. And we're asking everyone to hold their questions. So they can put them in the chat as we go along, but we won't have a Q&A session until after all the presentations to ensure that we have enough time and that all the presentations are able to be presented. With that, I'll introduce to you Dr. Lisa Indar, who will give special greetings to us this evening. Lisa. Good, good afternoon, everyone. It gives me, um, on behalf of the director of CAFA, it really gives me great uh, pleasure to bring greetings to all our, uh, all our uh, panelists, as well as all our um, participants in this special COVID-19 health rounds. Um, this COVID-19 health rounds is CAFA's way of really building capacity um, for our member states and other stakeholders to really mitigate, prevent, and address as well as control COVID. So it's geared towards reopening, it's geared towards surveillance, response, there would be topics later on on vaccination. There would be uh, topics on how do you have special, special uh, uh, measures for special groups and so on. Today, we are dealing with uh, surveillance, tackling community spread of surveillance and uh, control strategy. And I'm especially pleased that we have two esteemed guests, uh, the CMO of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Roshan Parasram, and the CMO of uh, Guyana, uh, our, new, our newest CMO, Dr. Narayan Singh. So I look forward to um, you know, a very fruitful webinar. Uh, encourage you to, to, to put your questions in, in the chat so that we would then be able to address. So good luck. Over to Angela. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Enda. Our next present presenter would be Dr. Stephanie Flagellati. Stephanie is a public health and biopreparedness epidemiologist with over 23 years of public health experience. 
She currently works as a consultant at CARPA, coordinating the works of the Health Information Communicable Diseases and Emergency Response Unit. Stephanie has worked extensively across research and frontline infectious disease management and emergency response. She started her career as a public health inspector in Jamaica and after a stint at regional as regional environmental health officer in Northeast Regional Health Authority, she relocated to Australia. She holds a master of public health with distinction from UE and a doctor of philosophy degree from the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. She has extensive experience in leading communicable disease surveillance and emergency response activities, including her role as coordinator for the Caribbean Burden of Health Stud Illness Study and the Jamaican arm of the study, and as bio-preparedness epidemiolo epidemiologist at the New South Wales Ministry of Health in Australia. Stephanie was recently awarded a prestigious Sanofi Pasteur Communicable Disease Epidemiology Award by the International Society for Infectious Diseases for her exemplary work in communicable disease epidemiology. I hand over to Stephanie Blachalati. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angela. We just have an echo here. We're trying to resolve where it's coming from. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Angela, for that lovely introduction. I do hope everyone is able to hear me clearly. So today, as the opening bats woman for this webinar, I want to take you through the epidemiological update on COVID very briefly. We will talk about some of the surveillance strategies that, that are often used in combating epidemics look at transmission scenarios and touch quickly on the control strategies. So just to give a quick overview of the current scenario with our pandemic, up to today at around 1.40 p.m., the confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally were 41,300,000 plus cases. Now, amongst this overall number of cases, we ha currently have a little bit more than 9 million active cases with around 1% of these cases considered as being serious or critical. Now, in terms of the total number of cases, as we can see here, that the vast majority are over 77% of cases have already been closed. Now, this includes around 4% of deaths with a case fatality rate of 2.7%. So without belaboring this too much, I wanted to, to just quickly mention that in the Caribbean, in our 33 countries and states and territories, there have been around 257, 800 plus cases reported to, up to today, with our 24 member states having around 48,388 cases with just under 1,000 deaths and more than 35,180 recoveries amongst the residents in our member states. That represents 77.5% of cases to date. So I'm just gonna 
run on quickly to just briefly go through some sur the surveillance strategies. Now, the World Health Organization Director General has repeatedly indicated that while our world has changed, the fundamental pillars of an epidemic response have not. Now, in a recent statement issued by the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, they echoed these sentiments by the WHO Director General. And they said that the worst of the pandemic can be avoided through rapid and robust action to minimize the transmission of COVID-19. By applying the core pillars of the outbreak response, and these pillars involve good political leadership, informing and engaging our communities, basic measures that are needed to suppress transmission and save lives, such as finding, isolating, and testing, and caring for cases, and ensuring that we trace and quarantine their contacts. This also includes, includes the provision of the measures, such as keeping distance, wearing masks and ensuring good hand hygiene practices are followed. Evidence from many countries, including our member states, have proven that these measures are effective. Lockdowns and border closures are usually short-term measures and they're usually used to gain time for building up the capacity for the public health response. For many of us and our our pres other presenters will speak more about this. They will tell you that disease surveillance and control activities remain the link that holds many of these strategies together. So what exactly is this disease surveillance that I'm talking about? So surveillance activities, they provide the core information on which our pandemic response decisions are based. The types of information that are needed during the pandemic will vary at different points in time. And this is usually based on the transmission scenario and will be generated by different types of surveillance activities. Pandemic surveillance should build on existing and routine surveillance systems that are either event-based or indicator-based. Our indicator-based surveillance data is usually collected analyzed and interpreted. And this information usually comes from our mandatory surveillance, our laboratories, our syndromic surveillance, and some veterinary and other types of surveillance systems. When these are analyzed and interpreted, then we can check for any signals. Event-based surveillance, which usually involves information coming from some of the non-traditional sources, such as our international partners, People will pick up information from the news, from tweet, tweets, and so on. This information is also treated in a similar way. And it is usually captured and filtered and then verified for authenticity. The signals arising from our indicator-based and event-based surveillance is then assessed. And based on our indicator thresholds, we create alerts that would then trigger an investigation and the implementation of the control measures. Across our member states, COVID-19 response, all the relevant aspects of disease surveillance have been incorporated. Now, in terms of our pandemic response, our surveillance activities are usually ongoing throughout all the different phases of the pandemic. So at the start of the pandemic, as the first case of the virus is detected in other countries, our syndromic surveillance systems and our activities are usually focused on identification of those signals among our cases of acute respiratory infections. Then as disease spread across the globe, activities focused on verifying initial reports of imported cases is what would occur. Then this, transitions into the detection of clusters and sustained human-to-human -human transmission of the viruses. In some countries, surveillance data reveal the source of the infection is unknown in larger outbreaks of local transmission. It is in this context that the local health authorities will classify their transmission scenario as one of 
community spread or community transmission. In the recovery phase of a pandemic, countries should therefore continue to test and submit a number of their cases to determine if and how the pandemic virus continues to circulate in their populations. And this is how we are able to detect whether there are new cases or if there is an upsurge in the number of cases. And this can also detect whether there are mutations in the viruses that we see. So we talk about the different transmission scenarios. Let me define for you, according to the World Health Organization, what some of these scenarios mean. In the Caribbean countries, we follow the WHO scenarios for definition of the transmission classification. Classifications are reviewed on a weekly basis and they may be revised as new information becomes available. So it, we have one classification or a scenario where we have no cases and that is where there are no confirmed cases. The next scenario could be one where we have sporadic cases with one or more cases that are oftentimes imported or locally detected. We can then have more cases clustering in time and geographical location or as a result of common exposures. And these are referred to as clusters of cases. Community transmission is where a country is experiencing a larger outbreaks of local transmission or multiple clusters that through their assessment of various factors, such as the number of cases that are not linked together, there are large numbers of cases reported through Sentinel or laboratory surveillance, or multiple unrelated clusters in various areas across the territory. These are usually considered as community transmission. In our Caribbean context, the surveillance data is crucial and this has implications for border security and is currently being used to inform the eligibility criteria for countries that enter into what we call our regional travel bubble. Countries have implemented or de-escalated their COVID response measures based on their unique transmission scenarios. And hence these definitions are very crucial and the information that helps us to classify this, these scenarios usually comes from our surveillance systems. So in terms of our classification, currently as of data reported today, we have nine countries in our among our member states that have reported community transmission. Six have reported clusters and five sporadic cases. As of today, there were four countries amongst our member states that did not report any cases of COVID-19. As you can see here, surveillance data can also inform how we are able to visualize what is happening amongst our member states. So based on data reported up to Monday, you can see here we present our seven day moving average of COVID-19 cases across all CARFA member states. And the highest seven day average was observed on the 23rd of September. And this seven day moving average represents the average number of cases for a seven day period that's calculated using the number of confirmed cases for the current day and the six days prior to the current day. Our surveillance data can also help to inform the groups of people that are most often affected. Here you can see we are presenting data for our member states and this shows the number of persons distributed by their age groups. And we can see here that amongst the population, persons between the age 20 to 59 years were the majority affected with the modal age group being 30 to 39. We can also identify which, which gender or what sex of people are affected. And we see almost equal distribution among the sexes with a slight preponderance towards the females with 54%. So just to give an example of how surveillance data is being used, and as I made mention before, how this information is very critical to informing the 
eligibility criteria for the CARICOM travel bubble. So the surveillance data is collected and this is analyzed. Accurate and reliable surveillance data is critical to informing the decision-making process, as I've said before. So countries are categorized ranging from those that have no cases to those who have low, medium, high, and very high risk with respect to the rate of positivity over a 14-day period. Now, the level of risk would be determined by the amount of positive cases per 100,000 population. Only those countries with no cases and those in the low risk categories would be eligible for participating in this travel bubble. Now, CAFA would assess the data that is, is received and advise on which countries are eligible for inclusion in the travel bubble based on their transmission scenario and the positivity rate. Now, the heads of government in the region have agreed that travelers from countries within the bubble would be allowed to have entry without being subject to the PCR testing procedures prior to arrival, and they would also be exempted from having to undergo quarantine restriction. It is therefore very critical for CAFA to receive the surveillance data. For example, surveillance data, including anonymized line listings of the identified COVID-19 cases would be needed in a timely fashion to, en to enable the calculation of these rates in a timely and reliable fashion. Now, I just want to say a few words on the public health measures in pandemic response. So in addition to our surveillance strategies, there are additional measures that are needed to help to contain a pandemic. And they are usually classified as the pharmaceutical or medical countermeasures. And this usually involves things like vaccination, and this could be seasonal or pandemic vaccination based on the availability of an appropriate vaccine. And of course, antiviral treatments that can also be used as prophylaxis, which is a preventive measure, or as treatment. Now, the, the, the non-pharmaceutical measures are those measures that are very important and everyone can participate in implementing those measures. So the non-pharmaceutical measures are usually those that can be applied by individuals, such as using personal protective equipment, following hand hygiene, or ensuring that they comply with voluntary or enforced quarantine and isolation. Community-based public health measures usually involve social distancing, closures of schools, teleworking, and other measures. And as I mentioned before, border closures and travel restrictions are often used as a temporary measure to enable response. The infection prevention and control measures are usually incorporated by healthcare workers. Now I wanted to show an example of how these non-pharmaceutical public health measures are being used around the world. So in the United States, across 16 states, including Washington, DC, they conducted a study that found that a significant decline was observed in COVID-19 measures, sorry, in COVID-19 growth rate in the number of cases after they mandated the use of face covering in public. And this was effective over time. And they saw that the, the numbers of cases reduced as the continuance of the wearing of face mask continued. Now in a second study that was published by Taslim et al, they compiled a line listing of transmission pairs in mainland China. And they showed that the mean serial intervals of COVID-19 was shortened substantially from 7.8 to 2.6 days within a month. So that meant that the, the time between persons 
being exposed to disease and showing symptoms was shortened. And that was related to the fact that people were now in isolation and they were closer together in, in that closed context. So you see that our surveillance data can provide valuable information to help us to understand what is happening in our population. Now, in closing, I wanted to really drive home that surveillance and the other measures are unable to work on their own without adequate community engagement that will provide the messaging to enforce and encourage compliance with measures. Now, we all know that over the last nine months or so, we've seen this infodemic with a lot of information coming out. And one of the things we've seen is that in many countries, some of the measures have failed as a result of lack of compliance among the population. Now, if we should liken this to, the, to a sinking ship, I believe there are some of the comments, some of the comments you would hear are what we are hearing today. Some people may say, it's dry over here. This sinking ship is a hoax. Well, if I drink fuel, maybe I won't freeze. Only the elders and the non-swimmers will die. Nobody can force me to wear a life jacket. I believe that what these comments underscore for us is that our greatest efforts must include engaging the community to build their trust for the evidence-based public health that we are delivering and to encourage local ownership of outbreak control response measures. I am not going to say much more about this because the next presenter will be going into more detail on that. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and to hand back over to our moderator. Thank you, Stephanie, for that very detailed and informative presentation. Next, we're going to have Dr. Cheryl Jones. And Dr. Cheryl Jones has obtained a Bachelor of Business Administration in Business Information Systems, a Master's in Business Administration with concentration in Finance and the Decision Sciences, a Master's in Public Health in International Health, and a PhD in Sociology. She has also received her training in medical sociology from Howard University in Washington, DC. She's also an educator with a plethora of experience in research focused on social behavioral aspects of public health, as well as in curriculum development and implementation. Dr. Jones has developed the curricula and designed the training modules for private institutions, including the United States University System and for multinational corporations. Her experience in higher education include research instructor and chair of culminating experience, master public health program, Morehouse School of Medicine, adjunct professor in health services administration, Stryer University, and guest lectures at various colleges in, in the United States and the Caribbean. I'd like to hand over to you, Dr. Cheryl Jones. Good afternoon, and thank you, Angela. So I am going to share with you um, a, little bit, a little bit of research, of existing research on COVID-19 and, and preventive behaviors. I'm just going to highlight a couple of studies. I'm then going to also highlight a global CAP study that was done 
by Johns Hopkins um, uh, School of Public Health. And the idea is to begin to answer this question of why is it that our communities, our persons in our communities are seemingly um, not engaging or seemingly not practicing preventive behaviors as much as we would like to, we would like for them to. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the need to monitor um, communities and what their needs are with, within the context of adhering to be preventive behaviors as well as informing um, surveillance data. So as it's with most pandemics, with most outbreaks, um, many of the same factors fuel preventive behaviors, fuel the practice of preventive behaviors or limit the practice of be pre preventive behaviors and address some of the ideas or um, issues around that sinking ship. Um, one of the first things that encourages preventive behavior has been proven even with the COVID, the very early COVID research, is that the fear of contracting COVID-19 is one of the major factors that ensures that persons in communities, individuals, um, organizations actually practice preventive behaviors, put them in place and um, motivate each other to practice. But we also know based on um, previous health conditions, previous epidemics, um, and studies, recent studies done on COVID-19, both in the United States as well as in China, that these risk fact, these other factors impact um, synergistically and individually persons' practices of preventive behaviors. So of course we know information and education, risk awareness, which is very much aligned with fear, Demographic, socioeconomic status, as well as gender are some of the main factors that have been identified as ones that positively impact or negatively impact preventive behaviors. So let's talk about some of the other factors that we've been focusing on. We focused on social media. Social media has had both a negative and a, a positive impact. For instance, um, there is a study out of, um, that's done by Allington et al, where it was confirmed that the um, conspiracy theory and mis misinformation provided in social media, specifically Facebook, had negative impact on preventive behaviors. However, there was a study done on YouTube, um, on YouTube documentations or uh, presentations that showed that the more information provided, the more education provided, the preventive behaviors were indeed practiced. So let's move to Johns Hopkins. The Johns Hopkins Center for Communications Programs did a, pro, um, a CAP study in July of this year. It's actually still ongoing, but the data that um, has been most recently published was published from July. And two Caribbean countries actually participated in the study. If you look at some of the data or, well, let's say two Caribbean, two Caribbean countries actually had enough data that they could be included in the study. So it was presented on Facebook. Um, it was weighted such that the data was considered to be representative from the countries. Each country had a minimum of 3,000 participants. Um, and if you look at the data on the screen, you would see that based on those findings, our countries are actually pretty doing pretty good with the preventive behaviors, probably much better than we may have expected. Um, physical, dis physical distancing is an area that looks like there should be improvement. And this last um, question was whether persons felt that people in their communities were going out to masks, whether or not persons felt that at least 50% of the people in their community were going out masks. So the column, the white column is just um, Australia, which I wanted to use as a comparison um, to the two Caribbean countries. And Australia did not answer the question, did not have to answer the question about the 50% mask. The next slide I wanna show you is, a, really impacts how we present information, where people find um, trusted sources, where they consider 
sources of information to be most trusted. These two Caribbean islands, or two Caribbean countries, had very somewhat differing um, levels of trust. Um, you would see that one of the countries put more trust in the World Health Organization's information, while others put more trust in their health experts in the local setting. Um, so this would encourage or inform us to focus our information sharing in particular areas if we're trying to reach those most trusted individuals or most trusted um, routes of sharing information. So let's move into community engagement. Based on the information we just shared, why is it important to engage communities and empower them to actually share and information and practice preventive behaviors from the community perspective? First, let's talk about real quickly what a community is. A community, we usually think about a geographical area, but given the current technical um, technology um, resources at hand, a community can actually be virtual. So you can look at a geographical area, a church, um, or uh, Facebook organizations, or even smaller um, groups um, like WhatsApp. So there are various communities that we can focus on when we look at messaging, when we look at community engagement, and when we look at empowering communities. So what we want to focus on is the public health messaging that comes behind um, or that's shared with communities that address preventive, preventive behaviors and COVID-19 policy and regulation updates. Based on the previous slides, we would, we would see that a lot of the preventive behaviors based on the CAP study are being practiced. But there are some areas that, one area that I was not able to collect enough, um, get the data on was isolation. The areas for isolating to prevent COVID-19 was very low in the, within the two Caribbean states. But the question was why? Unfortunately, a CAP study just gives you the data, doesn't answer the question why. So we would work, we would need to work within communities, engage communities and empower them to begin to answer these questions. So we would want to um, organize with communities to get them to work together mobilize resources which don't necessarily require or not necessarily funds, but community resources that assist in um, the reduction of the transmission of COVID-19. So there are different levels of community participation. Partic community participation is what drives the engagement. So passive participation is when we tell a community to do something and we don't want response. Active participation, participation is when we talk to a community, we get them um, engaged to some degree and, and we want them to respond, but we don't want them to necessarily move the project or move the activity. Community engagement, full community engagement, participation and empowerment is more of a bottom up approach where we utilize the community to actually move the activity, move the messaging, move the preventive behaviors from the perspective of the, of the community and in a manner that's sustainable um, over time. So when we look at what is needed for a continued addressing of um, the COVID-19 pandemic when it comes to community engagement, we have to look, we, we must look at um, risk communication and community engagement collectively. Risk communication, of course, is what we would have started at the beginning of the pandemic by developing strategies for addressing communi communications, addressing sharing information, addressing myths. But one of the other things that we need to look at is social structures. When you look at the Chinese um, situation, China is a socialist country. Therefore, their community engagement is a little different than many of the countries that are less socialist in their approach to healthcare. So for instance, in China, you would have um, a healthcare system that includes a representative from the community. Um, and that person is not a health related person, meaning they're not a doctor, they're not a public health professional, um, but they're really a representative from the community and they seek to address issues of why a community may or not may why a community or a person may have a problem following a recommendation or a regulation to 
to ensure that those communities are informed, empowered, and their issues are brought to the table and addressed. So those, that is an opportunity for other, um, I guess, less socialist structured um, countries to actually begin to look at how they can engage communities and have representation when it comes to the guidelines that are being requested or regulations that are being requested of communities and individuals to follow. So um, risk communication and community engagement includes ensuring that your risk communication systems, and this is um, an actual um, supported document. It was supported by the um, uh, World Health Technical, World Health Organization's technical guidance. And um, there was also a project in China that supported the engagement of communities utilizing this um, guidance document. And it looks at risk communication systems, making sure that they're adequately developed for the point at which you are in the response to the pandemic. Um, whether or not you have one or two cases where, or you have community spread, your risk communication system would look different. Make sure your internal and, and your, your internal partners are engaged and coordinated, that your public communication is clear, and that the community engagement is such that it's a two-way street. So information is being shared with the community as well as issues being addressed from the perspective of the community. So oftentimes we look at a, um, a, a community, whether it's a geographical community or a particular audience of people and say, they will not follow our directions. But the question is, have we engaged them to understand why they have not followed the direction? Do they understand the direction? Or is there some barrier that we need to address with them? Um, managing information is critical as well as capacity building. So those communities who, um, whether it be a virtual community or a, a physical community, building capacity within the community to share information is also uh, an opportunity that we could, could look at from the perspective of ensuring that information is flowing through the community, um, between the community and public health officials and other stakeholders. Um, Thank you so very much for listening and my presentation is finished. Thank you very much, Cheryl. So just a reminder that those who may have come in later, we ask you to please feel free to put your questions in the chat room and we'll address them late in, in the later in the, in the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Um, where we've reached now is we are actually going to hear from a couple of countries exactly what is happening on the ground and how they have, they have fared in terms of tackling community spread in their countries, some challenges, their strategies, and steps going, next steps going forward. Our next speaker is Dr. Roshan Parasram. Um, I'm, let me just bring up his presentation as we talk. Ram is a public health consultant and currently the Chief Medical Officer for Trinidad and Tobago. Prior to the appointment as Chief Medical Officer, he was a primary care physician too at the NCRHA, a, medic, a district medical officer, a county medical officer of health, and the former specialist medical officer of the Insect Vector Control Division of the Ministry of Health. Dr. Parasram was educated at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of the West Indies, and the prestigious London School of Hygiene and the Tropical Medicine 
University of London, where he completed his postgraduate diploma and master's in public health. He was subsequently issued the diploma of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health and holds a certificate in procurement law and practice from the University of York, Canada. Dr. Roshan Parasaram chairs the multi-sectoral committee who advises the Minister of Health and the Prime Minister on the COVID-19 pandemic response for the Republic of Trinidad Tobago. So I hand over to Dr. Parasaram. Hi, good afternoon, Hi, everyone. Um, and thanks um, for having us share our story from Trinidad and Tobago um, as it relates to commit tackling community spread. So uh, in a little background on the PowerPoint itself. Um, basically, we are going to take you through the epidemiological wave as it related to Trinidad. We categorize it as going through two phases in Trinidad. So there's a first phase and a second phase. We'll look at the strategic approach that we took We'll look at some challenges and some lessons learned throughout the process. So starting with a little history of the virus, which of course is the novel coronavirus started in on the 31st of December in a cluster of cases in Wuhan, China. On 11th of March, WHO declared the global pandemic. Just take you back one. Yeah, so just to put into context where we are now globally, we are just under 40 million cases confirmed globally. Of course, in terms of blue burden of disease, we'll come more into the Americas, 18,709, 984 confirmed cases so far. So starting internationally. Yep, just getting some difficulty going from side to side. Okay, so in terms of the Americas, we see that the Americas are supporting 46.83% at this time of the global burden. So we are somewhat of an epicenter in terms of the, the way COVID-19 is progressing through the world. We see in the United States of America, 8, 8 million cases. In Brazil, 5 million cases, accounting for 52.86% of Americas as well as globally 20.7%. Next slide, please. So in terms of Trinidad and Tobago, our first, world, first phase or first wave characteristics, our first phase began with the introduction of this case from a, a traveler who had gone to Europe on a short vacation. The first case was um, actually confirmed on the 12th of March, 2020 first phase goes until June 20th in Trinidad and Tobago. So what we had at that time prior to June, March 12th, we would have been classified, of course, as no cases. CAFA having, having started testing on or about the 7th of February, 2020, we would have had a carnival. We tested throughout. We got no cases during that time. As you would have noted, in the Americas and the UK at that time, there were little to no cases in those regions. Um, the majority of it would have been in Wuhan, China at that point in time. So we had our first case on March 12th. We continued to be during this during that phase in the sporadic phase for the entire period, more or less, where we were able to control the spread by rapidly tracking those persons who would have come back from other countries, different parts of the world based on the risk profiles, having them do some level of home quarantine at the time. And of course, if they develop symptoms, testing early and in this phase of the disease, what we did is we ensured that every positive patient was actually placed in a facility, whether it be step down or hospital for treatment within our parallel care system. I'll go more into the parallel care system and how we establish it later on. So in terms of public health facilities, again, at that point in time, we had two hospitals. Luckily in Trinidad, we were in the process of building a hospital called the Cuba Hospital and Multi-Training Center as well as the Arima General Hospital, which had in total combined, we had about 380 new beds to add to the system. We began using these for treatment of COVID-19 patients only and created a parallel healthcare system. We also added five step-down facilities, which were varying facilities ranging from 
uh, our National Rocket, Rocket Center, which was equipped with beds and um, various facilities so that we could have almost like a field hospital set up. Um, we had four other facilities, including the Rocket Center, which we used to house various patients with very mild symptoms from time to time. And we also used them in cases that were hospitalized instead of keeping our patients in hospital after they became well for quarantine purposes before we sent them home on their discharge criteria. We actually kept them in a step down facilities, um, arranged for their stay and ensured that they met our WHO discharge criteria at the time, which was which having two negative swabs at least 24 hours apart. Before they were sent home to their families. In that way, we tried to limit the amount of spread that was occurring by keeping all the COVID-19 patients in a hospital setting or a step down setting until we thought that they were no longer infectious and then sent them back into the community. We, at the same time, we were trying to build our capacity beyond CAFA. As you know, CAFA would have been the only reference lab testing at the time. We built out the University of the West Indies site, a site in the Tobago Regional Health Authority, as well as Trinidad Public Health Lab. Had some capacity in the early days. There was significant challenge with supply chain. There were some embargoes out of the US, even China and India for us to get supplies in, including non-farm PPE, et cetera, but more so for testing, it was very difficult to get supplies to set up all that. Um, statistically speaking, during the first phase, we had 4,286 samples submitted, 3,732 unique tests, 554 repeated samples, and for Trinidad and Tobago at the time, we had 100, just over 130 odd tests with eight deaths in that first phase. Next slide, please. So this would give you an idea of what was happening during that first phase. This is the epi curve. So you would see there was a point source introduction to some extent um, with travelers coming through throughout that period. During the period, the 24th of April, all the way until um, just before July, July, July 17th thereabouts, you only see a few space cases in between. Those would have been from nationals coming through our closed borders, repatriated, and they were held in quarantine sites. If you could go back to the last slide. Yeah, so they were held in quarantine sites, basically allowing us to keep that infection in quarantine sites of the repatriated persons. They got their double negative and then they were allowed to go home. So keep again, keeping it out of the community. Next slide. Right, so this gives you a little, um, our geographic information system department, which forms part of our epidemiology unit. will map the cases. If you look at the keys, laboratory can confirm cases in phase one uh, in red. Um, we had a large cohort, upwards of 60 people out of our first group of um, positives in phase, phase one that came from one source, which was a cruise ship that came back. Out of the 72 persons on board, 60 persons ultimately became positive from that group and almost it, it accounted for almost half of our first phase cases. They were housed in a, in a step down facility called Belandra for quarantine. Some of them were moved for, to hospital thereafter. They were not co-mingled with the population to decrease the risk of spread. Next slide. Right, so this is our second wave. You see our second wave actually begun on the 20th of July. So we had a period almost of 85 days between phase one and phase two, where we actually had no cases, local cases at all. The only cases we got were from repatriated persons coming into our quarantine sites. So in that phase, we were able to reopen our economy completely. So we were able to go to the beach. Um, everything was fully functional. Restaurants and bars were open. On July 20th, we believed that there was a reintroduction of the virus into the country via our possibly our illegal ports of entry. We had our borders closed at the time and there was strict um, quarantine still ongoing through our regular control borders. We had direct links of persons in the first couple of days of the second phase staying to us. They had links with persons that would have traversed the borders illegally. They would have been transporting them and some individuals would have been interacting with them at bars and different areas. So from that, we would have gone into a general election on August 10th. 
prior to the to the general election, we would have had a lot of campaigns going on during that period. So a lot of congregation of persons not wearing masks, very close contact. And we saw a rise in that purple area, which is August, gives us a very sharp um, peak going all the way up. September is in the darker blue. Um, thereafter, we began to see a little reduction. There was on the 25th of August, we introduced mandatory wearing of masks using the public health ordinance. So now in all public spaces, persons have to wear masks as law from the 25th of August thereafter to cover your nose, mouth, and chin at all times. If there can be a fine of up to $1,000 for your first TT, for your first offense, plus or minus six months in, in a state facility. So we see it, it the, the virus continuing onwards. To the right, we see the, the dark blue is September hovering around 60 cases per day, thereabouts. And the, the dark green on the right-hand side gives us October. The last seven-day average would have given us somewhere around 30 cases per day, which puts us around middle medium risk based on what Dr. Fletcher Lachi would have um, provided you all with regarding the CARICOM bubble. So we had a medium risk state at this point in time. So our numbers luckily have begun to go down. We had some closure of the economy. The things that we have closed at this point are beaches and rivers. We still have restaurants and bars open, but only for in-house, for takeaway dining, no in-house dining. We have churches and places of worship are closed at this point. Gyms are closed still. Um, and we have our public transport at 50%. Our public service remains at essential services 50%. Everything else remains open, and we are hoping if the numbers are improving, that we'll begin to slowly come back out um, come this weekend when our Prime Minister has some announcements to make. We can go forward. Next. Yeah, so again, uh, geographic information, GIS map showing basically the blue dots. There's a preponderance of disease along the west north side going all the way on the west coast. Um, it becomes more sporadic as you go towards the East Coast because the population density decreases. So you're seeing the blue, the blue dots predominantly on the West going to the South and the North, which is where the majority of the population lives. Next slide. So WHO core mitigation strategy, test, isolate, treat and trace. What we have done is establish and building capacity in a par parallel health system so that our regular health system can go on unaffected. So any case that is positive, they go straight into the parallel healthcare system for treatment. So there's no co-mingling of our existing public health system with COVID-19 cases. We isolate and treat, and we are trying to establish and increase our capacity for national testing. By way, as, as I noted before, creating multiple labs, we have now established the capacity to test upwards of 1,500 persons per day outside of um, the CAFA, CAFA's ability to test for us as well. In addition, um, we are going forward, of course, with PAHO. We have ordered 200,000 of the rapid antigen kits, which will give us some additional capacity within 15 to 20 minutes to be able to identify cases at the ANEs and the district health facilities. Of course, strengthening national surveillance systems as we go along to ensure that we are not missing any cases. Having said that, with the public health measures, we have seen a significant reduction in acute viral illness, acute respiratory illness, acute gastroenteritis throughout the year, starting in March and then continuing onwards. There was a spike in acute viral illness when we had the spike in COVID-19 in August and September, which has since leveled out and gone back into the control um, level. Next slide. So parallel has this healthcare system capacity at this point, tertiary care at Kuva, Cora, Augustus Long, which is a hospital in the Southern region, Arima Hospital, St. Anne's Hospital, which is a psychiatric hospital. We created a separate parallel system for psychiatric um, patients within the, the grounds of the general hospital there, but it is separate and apart physically in a different building. So we have separated those people and in the Scarborough General Hospital, we have a tertiary care parallel capacity of 410 persons at this time. Step down facility is giving us a, a total capacity of 416. Our quarantine sites are 615 and our suspected sites are 
141, giving us a total of 1,551 bed spaces in the parallel system at this point in time. Next slide. Again, um, just to reiterate, sorry, if we could go to the next slide. Yeah, so our Nash, yeah, back, back one, please. Yeah, so again, just, just to go over um, of different sites that we will have been able to establish, the University of the West Indies site for testing, Tobago Regional Health Authority, North Central Regional Health Authority, Eastern Regional Health Authority, the MRF of Trinidad and Tobago, again, another site at North Central, Southwest. So in total, we're looking at 1,550 samples being able to be processed per day based on all our sites. Next slide. So our first wave strategy, again, establish a parallel health system, increasing national capacity, but minimize the risk of local transmission by trying to quarantine all repatriated persons. All positive persons were isolated quickly. Schools were closed, public were at stay at home at the time, and there were stay at home guidelines which were issued for the sector. We were reducing importation by closure of the formal border um, with regards to migrants, non-nationals policy allowed us to treat, test and treat at no cost anyone that came in with public health diseases. And we began a phased approach to reopen. Next slide. So just to show, this was how we, we were in the process of reopening and we did reopen fully um, between phase one and phase two. So again, we started with phase um, food establishments and restaurants um, being closed, itinerant and non-itinerant business allows to commence, curbside pickup and deliveries and drive through only at the time, reopening of the manufacturing sector, construction sector, garages, laundromats, and then we went onwards um, in terms of capacity and risk. So it was based on public health risk. We had the stage now, and this was early on, we had reopened fully and then we closed again Subsequently, but not a major closure as we did in the first phase, we were able to keep a lot of our business, business sector, for example, manufacturing and construction open throughout phase two. We are at this point, as I said before, looking at possibly having closed at this point, real um, places of worship, cinemas, gyms, theaters, bars, in-house dining at restaurants and the public service capacity. Next slide. So, for the second wave, again, our community transmission is, is where we're at in terms of WHO classification, in terms of the Caribbean bubble, we are hovering around 30 cases per day, medium risk at this point in time. Parallel health facilities increased capacity during this phase to bring us to the pres present setting. Testing capacity has been increased as well. And in terms of statistics, we have 34,593 tests done in the public sector we have also partnered with the private sector who has been able to complete 17,000 tests so far. So in total for Trinidad, we have done 51, over 51,000 COVID-19 tests with unique tests going up upwards of 48,000. And of those, we have just over 5,300 being positive with 97 deaths at this point in time. Predominantly, we are seeing our deaths occurring in the elderly with comorbidities in 70 to in, in probably more than 80% of cases. Next slide. This is basically a quick dashboard that we had started a couple of weeks ago to give the population a, a daily update by press, conf press release. So we do this every day at 4 p.m. so that there's enough time for the press to have that for the evening news. So it's a daily press conference at the height of our epidemic. We would press release, sorry, a day, we would have been doing a press release three times a day and having a press conference once a day, once a day. At this point in time, we have a press release done once a day and we have our press conferences hosted by the Ministry of Health on a Monday, Wednesday, and a Saturday. Next slide. So again, increased parallel system capacity. We had a prominent feature of the second phase as opposed to the first phase. We took a policy decision in August as well based on the number of cases that we were seeing to go away from bringing every case into a hospital. And we began to have patients nursed at home, the well cases, they are being followed up twice a day by our county medical officers of health using telemedicine. 
they are collecting all that data. We are give, we have given out pulse oximeters to every single household that has, has a positive case. So we can mitigate the risk of silent hypoxia occurring in those individuals. The, the response from the rapid response EHS system, which is an ambulance system, has been very good to support bringing persons into hospital if they decompensate at home. We have reduced number of positive cases due to what we believe, of course, is legislation related to wearing of masks, evolving public health policy, and reinforcement of public health messaging. Next slide. So again, it's a difficult balance because we get a lot of toing and froing from the public, from the um, chambers of commerce, from different persons to reopen the economy, but we have to do so safely. If we only, it's very difficult to be certain whether persons have the new learned behavior of the new normal wearing your mask appropriately, staying at home when you're ill has been a significant challenge in our community. We have not been able to think either get the message across appropriately that persons should stay at home when they're ill. And it has been a significant driver of this, um, of this epidemic in Trinidad and Tobago. So again, um, there's issues related to the parallel system, meaning that we have to expand the workforce and the workforce is finite. There's a capacity that needs to be created in terms of a financial capacity to run these additional facilities. And of course, avoiding burnout for essential workers. COVID-19 testing capacity constraints, as I mentioned before, it has been a struggle to set up those, um, those additional labs, but we have been able to do, um, take some time longer than we anticipated, but set them up in the medium term. And so there, there continues to be a global demand and supply chain interruption issue and limited specialized laboratory staff and equipment available to continue our testing. Those are major constraints with testing. Next slide. So significant increases in cases in the second wave. Um, the capacity to admit every positive case has exceeded our ability to bring them into hospital. There was some timeline reporting issue in the middle phase while we continue to build the capacity for laboratory, therefore resulting in our inability to see what was happening with the epidemic new cases on a real-time basis, which we now can do um, in this particular phase. Surveillance system strengthening occurred with digital data collection, analysis, and reporting. Public health measures, as I mentioned before, mandatory mass, leveraging technology, for example, um, hardware, hardware uh, limitations and staff proficiency. Next slide. So again, essential to minimize risk to patients and staff, significant resources required. Um, with regards to our parallel healthcare system, establish and expansion, the testing facilities, difficult balance for public safety, calculated risks must be taken. And I think um, as the Ministry of Health and as we advise the Minister of Health and the Prime Minister, we have to balance lives and livelihood, but there can be no livelihood without any lives. So we have taken a very, in the second phase coming out of, of lockdown, we have taken a very slow and steady approach where we can actually look at our statistics, see if the, what responses we're having to our public health, lifting of our restrictions and gone very slowly as we have tried to come out of this um, partial closure of, of the economy. Next slide. So again, strengthening surveillance, human resource capacity. We are looking outwards beyond Trinidad to have importation of staff. We already got assistance from Cuba. We're looking to other territories to do so because we just don't have enough staff in the country to supply the needs at this point in time. Use of technology, and of course, workplace policies to allow for virtual meetings, flexi time, work from home has been very well used in, in the public sector and more so in the private sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Next slide. Supply chain management, again, very critical. We have established a small unit in the ministry to make sure we manage the supply chain very, um, is a very critical part of the response. Of course, without consumables, without, we can't test. So we have been monitoring it on an hourly basis to ensure we don't run out of essential commodities. Collaboration is essential amongst our RHAs. We have five RHAs in the country. They often have a silo approach, but with this global pandemic, we have been able to bring them together and collaborate in a better way as one, um, to have one national response. In terms of legislation, again, the, there was strong use throughout of the public health regulations. Public health ordinance is a very old ordinance in Trinidad 
it speak to, speaks to times when we had no vaccines, we had no treatment, much like we have for COVID at this point in time, has been a very useful tool to restrict movement and, and certain activities while we put things in place to ensure that the economy can open safely. Mandatory mass use has gone a long way to curtail the spread in Trinidad and Tobago um, and continues to do so. Next slide. Yeah, so just before I close, I just want to say COVID-19, I think, in my personal opinion, will do for public health what 9-11 has done for global security. It will change the way we, we view hygiene. It will change the way we view infection prevention control. I think everyone has, has um, been in the health sector and out, out otherwise have actually changed the, the mindset as how we view communicable disease as a whole. And um, it will really change. I don't think things can go back to normal. There is a new normal that will have to continue. And we are in a period in Trinidad and Tobago, and I suppose the rest of the world, that we are transitioning from an old state to a new state. And we have to find out um, what our new normal will be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Parasaram, for that detailed insight into the COVID-19 response here in Trinidad and Tobago. And your parting words is, is considerable food for thought and then something that we must mull over and recognize and accept. Thank you. I'm gonna stop my share now. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Singh from Guyana. I'm um, stopping the share so that you can share your screen, Dr. Singh. In the meantime, I'll introduce Dr. Singh. Dr. Narayan Singh is currently the CMO of Guyana and was educated at the School of Medicine, University of Guyana, and holds an MSc in Infectious Disease from the University of London. School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and also holds an MSc in Obstetrics, Gynecology, University of Guyana. Prior to his current position, Dr. Singh served in several capacities across the health system in Guyana. He has served in the capacity of medical officer in several hinterland regions of Guyana and at the Georgetown Public Hospital. He held the position of Director, National P Blood Transfusion Services, Director of Regional Health Service, Coordinator of the Cervical Cancer Prevention Program, and Senior Registrar of Obstetrics and Gynecology. In the area of training, Dr. Singh is the Adjunct Associate Professor in Obstetrics and Gynecology at the School of Medicine, Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Guyana. He also is a Senior Lecturer of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Texelia American University. I hand over now to Dr. Narayan Singh. Uh, Dr. Singh, I think you're muted. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Singh, I think you're still muted. Let me, let me just uh, I think you're on now. Okay. Right. You're getting my share. You're... Yeah, you're not in presentation mode as yet, though. Okay. Yes. What I did. <laughs> From the beginning. Oh, man. That's okay. Yes. It's up at the top. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, share. I'm there yet? Not yet. You just need to. I think you shared the. Slide. Your, yeah, you shared your your browser. You need to share your slide. Right. In the meantime, I want to acknowledge 
Dr. Joyce and John, who has joined us. Welcome. Am I there yet? Would you like us to bring up your slides, Pat? Bring, I, I think you might be too, because I, I kind of lost. Sure, not a problem. Okay, give me one minute. All right, let me just... Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to thank Carfu for inviting me to be part of this um, series. Um, I will just, my talk is just to share the experience that we've been um, so far in tackling the spread of COVID within the community. What are our challenges and how we have been able to do it? So just an introduction um, to the thing that our first case of COVID was diagnosed in Guyana on the March, 11th of March, and that was an imported case from the US. Following that case, you know, they, we had some patients from the same family members who were tested and they were um, also positive. That patient eventually died. And then this happened, um, then we had the initial um, family members who were tested also positive. At that time, our, system was probably not prepared for this because our testing capacity at that time was very limited. We had to, we were only doing um, cases that were um, symptomatic or patients who were only symptomatic at the time. And even close contacts were not actually being tested until they were actually symptomatic. Unfortunately, this the COVID caught us in the middle of an, an election and the political instability that happened that followed um, during that period. And so it was already a uh, tough time for, uh, for the health system to cater for these, what was to come afterwards. Next slide, please. Following that initial cases, we have, we have, been, uh, we have seen a steady rise of cases in Guyana. Um, initially, because of we were not doing uh, enough testing, initially we were probably doing just 10 to 15 case, um, testing our cases per day. However, following August um, this year, our testing capacity has increased. Uh, we are now able to do a maximum of um, 300 case tests per day. Right now, our capacity, we are having about 150 to 200 tests being done daily. This is just a picture of um, what is happening so far up to date. And this is on the 19th, 18th of October. Uh, we have had um, a total of 3,734 cases. And actually, in fact, up to yesterday, we had 3,769 cases with and the deaths of 116 deaths so far. Um, we have done a, a, 
up to date, a total of 17,269 cases. So we are, our uh, positivity rate is somewhere around 21%, which is kind of high. To date, we have seen cases in all parts of um, turning up in all parts of in all regions of Guyana. We know for those who have known Guyana that there are ten um, regions. We have the coastline and some of the hinterland regions. We have seen cases in all regions so far. But two of the regions that are really uh, where we see most of the cases, which is region four, which is a coastland region, where about almost seventy percent of the population resides, and uh, one hinterland region. Region one, which has the second highest number of cases, but cases have been shown up in all regions to date. Next slide, please. So our so we have a case fatality um, um, or, um fatality rate of two point zero percent, right? And that is kind of high. Um, next next slide, please. Again, most of fatality is is, is in the um, the over fifty age group. 73% of the um, patients are died at over 50 years old. And again, like the situation in Trinidad, we are seeing most of our patients who are died are those the elderly patients and those with existing comorbidities. What we have done so far and what the, uh, the strategy we have put in place is that um, in the absence of a vaccine or any specific protocol, we have we realize that the only strategy, the only thing that we can able to control the spread is to prevent the community spread. And this is what, what one of the things that the um, points we are actually focusing on at the present. Next slide. So from the start of the, um, the um, first case, we have put certain measures in place. One, we have established a, a national task force to overlook the uh, implementation of the response. And this task force was mainly made up of people from, diff uh, uh, from the different sector, the private sector, the military, the political um, in, um, persons. We have people from different regions, including the health personnel. Then we had, we established a, a health emergency operation center, which was task responsible to coordinate the response. And this is where the surveillance team was brought in place and in, in, in regard to the medical personnel. And we had set up uh, regional teams in all 10 regions of Guyana. These are small medical teams that were dedicated to for the uh, COVID response. And these teams were established in all 10 regions, including medical personnel there. We had to actually um, post in some of the hinterland regions they were only minimal um, staff. We had to actually get get staff from the central area and send them into these areas to um, boost up the, t the medical um, team there. We have had started a medical hotline, uh, what we call the COVID hotline, to do contact tracing for patients who were positive. Um, then we had the implementation of the uh, lockdown measures it was started on 17th of March. And those, those measures were kind of strict. We had to lock down from six to six restaurants, schools, they, they had limited work in hours. Public transportation was not, um, was also affected. We were, there were strict uh, rules regulation to stay at home orders for people, non-essential workers. Only essential workers were, were um, allowed to um, join the hours of six to six. That went on for a month. Then it was, they, we had two further extension of those orders. In, in addition to the, uh, to the lockdown measures, we had a COVID campaign, public education campaign that was launched both nationally and, and, we, and throughout all the regions where persons were told about the public health measures, preventative measures to, um, to institute to prevent the spread of COVID. And then the, um, the mass distribution campaign, face mass distribution campaign. Initially, we had some challenge there because the the messages that were be coming out was whether masks were effective, whether it was not effective in the initial stages. Persons were reluctant to wear the mask because they were getting conflicting information from the different sources. 
but eventually after the sec, uh, somewhere in, in July, sometime in July, when it was made mandatory, we had a effect that face masks, the use of face masks in in the public was um, was the thing to go. And so the campaign of uh, face mask distribution was started. We had many NGOs coming on board, actually sewing and distributing masks um, free, right? Next slide, please. Next slide. As I mentioned before, we had two, three emergency orders to date that included curfews. The last one that was done on, in September extended, um, was done at the end of September, extended the, the curfew until the 31st of October. That there were some slight changes to those uh, orders. We had changed back the, um, the curfew time from now from 4 from 4 a.m. in the morning to um, to 6 p.m. in the afternoon. So that has been a change, but travel is still restricted. Um, Non-essential workers are, are still, um, uh, the law, uh, requirements are still for non-essential workers to stay at home. School is still out at, the at, at this time. Um, this, with the implementation of the national, um, the, the, the restrictions, we had the enforcement law enforcement agencies being part of the, uh, to enforce the regulations and the protocols there. So we had to get the law enforcement agency on board. Next slide. Again, this slide is just telling you about some of the, um, the it, some of the enforcement, some, some of the regulations protocol that were put in place. We had, there were restrictions to outdoor activities, gatherings. We had restrictions on parties, no beaches, no uh, lines, hotels were, pools were closed. Uh, restaurants were only allowed to do takeouts. All bars were closed. And the problem with this is was that the restrictions, even though they were, the curfew was there on, enforcement was a, uh, was a serious challenge because the law enforcement at that time was challenged during those period from March to August because of the unstable political situation. So they were not able to focus on the, the lockdown measures and enforce them. And at the same time, dealing with the, the, the situation that was existing in the country at the time. Next slide, please. So the measures included face masks. We had the personal hygiene measures that was implemented in all um, that the public was educated on. Social distancing was um, indicated on, on those um, business and um, government agencies that were functioning or, um, to implement these measures. Next slide. So these were all some part of the uh, measures that were, were indicated. Next slide. COVID testing, the challenges we had with initially, again, as I mentioned, testing capacity was limited initially, but as we started, um, we had uh, issues with supplies. And we got some donations from, from the international agencies, such as PAHO. One of our CARICOM members did send in some um, testing and um, supplies for us, Barbados. Initially, but it, the lab was not up to date. We didn't have enough laboratory personnel to, to do the number of tests. However, over the last five months to six months, we have done some training program with the laboratory staff. There are now more staff who are trained to run the PCR testing. We did got some help from the Chinese government in terms of a PCR machine and some, and we were able to purchase some new machines from with some um, donation from the from the U.S. government. Those are now being put in place. Our capacity is now up to about 600. We can do six about 600 tests up to date. Uh, we are running about 300 tests to date, so we can do more testing now. So more, we, we have expanded the criteria for testing for patients or persons who might be uh, wanting to have a test done. We have established um, mobile testing sites in some areas where the, the, the um, high density areas, such as in region four, which is one of the highest, the area region with the highest population. And those mobile units goes out every day and we do samples we have set up um, testing sites at some of the health facilities. 
one of the challenge we had though was with um, existing uh, facilities, for especially for, um, contact tracing or contacts or persons who are uh, positive but were not symptomatic. We had to revert to home isolation, and that because we didn't have enough facilities to uh, host these patients in the institution. The facility, many of the, the main facilities in Georgetown, the uh, Georgetown Public Hospital was challenged because it was never really fitted out. It never had an infectious disease ward per se. And so we had to do some retrofitting. We, and our ICU at, at that time was just could have handled just six ICU beds. And we had to expand it to a 16 bed ICU, got ventilators on board and to set up a I, ICU. So the hospital services were severely disrupted. Some of the existing ward had to be retrofitted to put um, isolation units in place for, for the COVID uh, positive patients. And so many services were affected. Routine surgical cases had to be um, put down. Um, admissions were put at uh, only um, real emergency patients from with other conditions were really were admitted. And many of the hospitals that were in this, in, the, in the other regions, the smaller district hospital, had to re, had to be retrofitted. Put in, um, infectious disease wards had to be created. Isolation units had to be created. So it was a lot of work at that time. Many of them were not prepared because we didn't. Uh, we had to get special budgetary allocation, emergency budgetary allocation for these. So we um we would see next slide. So one of the um, challenges was the large number of patients who we had on home isolation. And this was a challenge to actually monitor these patients. And especially in some of the regions where we, we had patients in the hinterland regions who didn't have telephone contact or to get access to them was, was difficult. And even though we um, patients were told how to um, self-isolate, we had low adherence to stay home orders and social distancing orders. Many of the patients would have um, told you that, well, they're staying at home. And in fact, they were actually moving around. Some patients even give us wrong information, wrong telephone numbers, wrong address. When we turn up, when the team call them, you would get a, a wrong, that is not, that is a wrong number. The addresses sometimes are not the true addresses. That was really challenging. Again, the same um, problem we suffered again with the socialization of the events, right? Um, in many of the cases, the people were not believing that this was a truth, something that was true that was actually happening. Uh, many still continue to defy the orders. Patient, we could have still have seen, even though there were law, law enforcement um, out there, we had a couple of persons who were charged. Police went into a couple of bars, closed them down. Uh, people went before the court. But despite all these measures, we still see a large section of the population still not adhering to the uh, orders of wearing masks and public distancing. And so this is, um, because of this, we are now embarking on a uh, lengthy country-wide campaign again of public health education. We, uh, we have the members of the cabinet going out every weekend to various communities to enlighten them and to encourage them to follow the measures to, such as the wearing of the mask and high, and hygiene and encourage preventing social gatherings and so on. So the, we have the uh, members of the cabinet coming on board. Law enforcement have been no more compliant because uh, we have the army and the police on board, but they are also challenged again because the lack of um, um, vehicles, enough staff to, um, to, to patrol entire um, areas is sometimes challenging. Next slide, please. Monitoring surveillance, we had issues with that. Even though we had set up a call center and an ME unit, again, we had issues with the patients, um, persons giving wrong information because of this stigma, I um, feel of this, the issue of stigma being stigmatized that they, they were COVID positive, they didn't want anybody coming and checking them or a medical personnel visiting their homes. And so people would have given wrong address, wrong telephone numbers. Persons were um, also um, 
challenge with the uh, surveillance system again because of a limited number of telephone lines and access to internet. Many persons were not able to be contacted and some of them we were lost to follow up because they keep moving around. And when we checked them back again, they were not there and not at that address. So that was challenging and that was one of the things that they actually encouraged. Um, we know that were, they were positive. And the fact that we were not doing a second test, we were just putting them in home isolation and, and waiting on if they become symptomatic. So those who were asymptomatic for about the 14 days and then they were clear, then they were cleared and were declared uh, not active case. And so that was a challenge because we had to keep them isolated. We had very limited um, isolation facilities. So we had to activate some schools we had to, uh, uh, that were out to use them as isolation facilities. Some of the hospitals then had enough space we were using some public buildings that were not actually made out or for isolation facilities. Many of the patients didn't um, stay in there. They would overnight, they would escape from the from the building. We had to get law enforcement to um, to get bring them back, search and find them. So that those are some some of the challenges we had. Next slide. Next slide. Right. So that. So our experience is that our system was probably not prepared for this, but as the epidemic, um, as the pandemic did show that as it on, is ongoing, and we still have a steady increase of cases. But the government uh, recently made a decision to open back our airports, despite the high, um, the high positivity rate. What is the situation we are monitoring? So far, we have had over a thousand since the reopening of the reports. We have about a thousand persons who have re-entered Diana, and only one positive case was detected. We are using the protocol of 72 hours with a PCR. You must enter Diana with a, a negative PCR less than 72 hours. And if you are positive, if it's more than 72 hours, you will do a testing at, this, at the port of entry. So far, about 20% of the persons turning up are actually having to have a test done and only one case so far have detected. This is a situation we are monitoring so, um, so that we can advise the, um, the national task force, but it is, it is something that we can continue or we'll have to go back, revert back to normal. But so far it looks, they're satisfied with the, with the reports that they're getting. Um, the government is planning to reopen slowly. Back to work orders are some are issued. We have or a person returning to work on a, on a cautious basis. We, so we are monitoring the situation, but we're still having some clusters of, of, um, of cases in, in some of the regions. And this is because um, we have patients um, not who are not getting tested or coming out for like, like the minors and especially the interior location who are going home from being part and going, going back to their, to their residence and they're bypassing the health authorities. And some of them are not actually reporting. We have had issues with some in some communities, especially among the indigenous communities, where um, some of the indigenous um, person, um, the, the, the two shows, what we call the leaders of the indigenous uh, villages, are believing that this COVID is, is not something real. It's, it's a superstitious thing, and they're actually encouraging some of the, um, the residents in those communities not to get tested. We have recently had to call in the, uh, the police to um, and get involved um, with the local community to speak with these local leaders so that they can get their people to follow their orders and come and get tested if they're, if they're um, showing signs and symptoms. So that's a challenge. And we also have this challenge with the open borders, especially along the, um, down in South, along the Brazilian border, even though the, the border crossing has been closed, but because it is so easy to cross over from Guyana to Brazil, we have had patients just, uh, persons just crossing over on a daily basis. It's just a, uh, a five minutes boat paddle. You can get over to Guyana border or you can go over back to Brazil. In the case with the Valenzuela border, it's very porous. There's many, many um, wide open border. The law enforcement agency is not able to patrol that border adequately. And with the migrant crisis, we have people coming and going on a daily basis, bypassing health authorities. But we do have some areas where the, the team are going into to these, um, where these migrants are con congregating to get them tested. But by the time we see them, 
their their move again. And so that is proven to be a challenge for us. And they come in, in the mix with our population. So some of them are proud to be positive, um, 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 COVID positive and mingling with our population. And then they, they spend a two to three days in our in our communities and then return back to Venezuela. It's, it's sometimes a difficult situation. We hope with more um, law enforcement and better patrol of the borders, those are the situation that can be, be, uh, be brought on kind of control. And so this is our challenge. So we are still, our this COVID um, pandemic, we're still learning, we're still um, trying to, how to be, um, best manage this, uh, this spread and bring down the spread. And at the same time, balancing what is the health, the health situation, at the same time, looking at economic um, uh, impact, how we can best balance, get, bring a balance between the two. Next slide. So that's the presentation of the challenges that we are facing in Guyana. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh, for detailing your experiences and the real and many challenges on the ground. We can see many uh, similarities as well as differences between the two the experiences. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. St. John, our executive director, to spare us a few words at this moment. Thank you, Dr. St. John. I don't know if you are hearing us or if you may be muted. Uh, Thank okay, you. I, know. I think as a participant, I didn't have mic rights. So thank ah, you very okay. much for giving me mic rights. Uh, I just wanted Apologies. to say that the um, chief medical officers have given us a wealth of information. Not only us, CARFA, because this is very useful information for our own needs in terms of analysis um, and projecting for the future, but also the members of the audience. And I want to thank our two CMOs for showing the audience why it is that the CARICOM region has been doing so well um, in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. You see the level of preparedness, the care and the attention. And I really liked what um, Dr. Paris Ram said that without your people, it makes no sense trying to return to economic activity. And that focus on ensuring the health and well being of the people of CARICOM is something that we need to maintain. The chief medical officers are the backbone of the response. And I must say that our new CMO, Dr. Singh, has really had a, a, very, a very serious baptism. To come in now at this point in the pandemic, it means that you, you really have to be busy and CARFA is here to support you as much as possible. So I want to thank both CMOs, but I especially want to thank the new CMO who has um, agreed to give us information so early in his tenure. Um, I have been faithful in my attempts to attend these COVID health rounds because they are not only informative, but they're truly interesting. And it's nice sometimes to sit back and learn new things. And I've learned quite a, a lot of new things. So thank you for this opportunity to speak. 
Thank you, Dr. St. John, for those words and thoughts. We we'll move quickly on to the Q&A session. Uh, we have a number of questions. Uh, the first one I'm going to direct to Dr. Singh, seeing that you are on the floor. Um, Ghana has made the decision to reopen its borders against recommendations made by PAHO. Recommended or reopening when positivity rates below are below 5%. However, Guyana's positivity rate is recent is currently at 21%. What is the government's plan to keep the population safe? So I um I know it's a very um brave decision to open up the ports, but this was a decision made at through the national task force, which is really um, headed by the Prime Minister, even though we do have health um personnel on that um, task force. And I think it was this was a discussion that was going on and on between the, the 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 business sector and the president and the prime minister and so on and and, and, we, and it was the decision was made, but we had cautioned them that it should be monitored because things can get out of control, and so that's why we have introduced the other the measures the, the measures for persons coming in, so that you should have your testing done before you arrived in the country. And we will do testing at the point of entry for those who have uh, uh, PCR less than 72 hours. So far, it's kind of working, but we have to look at the situation, keep monitoring it on a daily basis. Um, the president and the prime minister is optimistic about this. The private sector is optimistic about this, but we are, as the health personnel are holding our breaths and uh, waiting to see what is going to, uh, how things play out. But I know it's a very brave decision, but we will, and so we had to, it was really a fight between the health people and the, um, the business sector to get this done. They had probably won out, but they still, we still have to watch the situation. That's, that's my response. Yeah, yeah. Mm. thank you. Um, I have one for Dr. Parasra. How will the testing algorithm be changed with the introduction of use of the antigen rapid tests? In what scenarios or situations will these kits be used? Okay, so the, the rapid test kits, are there's a nasopharyngeal swab that has to be taken either way, where we expect to use them in Trinidad and Tobago. There are two types that we are procuring, a Q-type and an F-type. So the Q-type is like a pregnancy test, but you do it with a nasopharyngeal swab. You can use those in peripheral health centers. They give you a, a sensitivity of about 84%. There's another type called the F-type, which actually has a reader, very similar to a, a desktop or a coulter counter that we use for CBC, like a rapid test. That is placed, can be placed. We intend to place it at the accident and emergency departments at the district health facilities throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Gives you a result between 15 and 20 minutes, at least from the, the supplier's end and PAHO's end, it's giving us a sensitivity of 90, upwards of 99%, which is almost as good as PCR. So what it does is that it, it, you, are, you are able for, take a, an example of a person coming into an accident and emergency department very ill. In our setting, because we have a parallel system, we can swap that, now swap that person, get a result in 15 minutes. If they are positive, we, we take them across to the parallel system and they're treated there. And if we get a negative result, we can send them on our ward safely and treat them as a COVID negative patient. So it allows us very easily to separate positive and negative patients, treat them in the parallel system versus the regular system so that we again decrease the risk of having positive patients in our routine system so there's no cross-contamination happening there. And it of course allows for very quick, because we are, we are getting a, a large quantity close to 200,000. It offers us the ability to test a greater proportion. Once people allow us to, of course, because testing is voluntary, a greater proportion of those individuals that present with symptoms. Bearing in mind the WHO, recent discoveries from WHO based on a study that was done out of Singapore and other parts of the world, which indicates that persons who are asymptomatic but positive are not driving forward this epidemic in a great way, meaning they are not very infective. 
So we are continuing in Trinidad and Tobago to use the strategy of testing those with symptoms and offering testing to those individuals. We do offer PCR testing to asymptomatic individuals who are primary contacts of, of persons, very close primary contacts. So that's the only scenario we are doing testing for asymptomatic at this point, but it will predominantly be used for accident and emergency department district health facilities as to give us a very quick turnaround. So we'll know in the, in the spirit of a minute, what is 15 minutes, 20 minutes, what is whether the patient is positive or next, negative. We see it as a game changer in the way community spread is handled. For example, if someone presents with symptoms of the workplace, we can send them to a facility. They can be tested in 15 to 20 minutes. And we know exactly what is happening, whether you have COVID or not. And therefore, all the sequelae of quarantine, isolation, sanitizing buildings, in the event that someone becomes positive days or weeks later, based on the normal routine testing, will be not necessary. We can get a very rapid turnaround and we hope it will change the way we treat with COVID in Trinidad and in the world at large. Okay. All right, back to Tafa. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. Um, I have two questions that I'm going to, to kind of tackle at one time. So I'm gonna give you the question. The, the first question is in general, the messaging about the pandemic has been pretty good, but why do you think the messages are not getting through to the general public? Um, I think some of the messaging may not be mainstream enough or presented in colloquial language to resonate with the public. That's number one. And the second one is how do we get community participation in public health interventions with prominent culture prominent cultural figures like Buju Bantan, public advertising against such interventions. So I wanna put these together. There's not one particular answer or one particular approach that can be taken. taken. Um, the best way to get the messaging, well, first, because I don't, I have not seen very clear research showing that the public is not getting the messages. I'm not able to say that the public is not getting the message. It may be that the public is not able to act on messages that they're receiving. So we would need to be able to answer those questions first. Um, and I think that's where we have the opportunity to do develop more interventions based on communities' inputs, engaging communities to help us develop the interventions and implement them. This also would help us to address um, some of the persons, whether they are prominent figures or local figures who may not be in support of an intervention. So when you have with risk communication, you look to look, you look for your supporters, your influencers, and you try to engage those entities or per people to try to deflate, if any, if I could put it that way, deflate the messaging that's coming from the people who are not in support of interventions and also better understand why communities and persons aren't able to implement. So there's some research and work that we need to do on the ground in real time as we're developing it and implementing these interventions. I did those two. Um, the next question is for Stephanie. In what ways has the response to COVID-19 affected established surveillance of other infectious vector-borne diseases and NCDs at the local community and the national levels? Thanks, Angela. So this would have happened in different settings quite differently. So in countries that were more heavily affected, some of those countries would have had to repurpose staff to assist with the COVID-19 response. For example, in many countries, environmental health officers for, as one group would have been assisting quite significantly in contact tracing, 
ensuring you know they are doing border security and port health and quarantine type measures. For the non-communicable diseases, I believe PAHO also did, did an evaluation of this and they showed where different countries had repurposed staff. So not just staff, but other resources. It's it's possible that, you know, in at the at the local level and at the national level, a lot of staff may be repurposed to assist with the COVID-19 specific response. In addition, because of some of the measures that have been implemented, the staff would need to be focused on helping to protect the, the routine public health services. And so in some of those cases, what some of the reports are showing is that it, to some extent, depending on the magnitude of the impact at the, the different levels in a country, they may have repurposed their staff, but this would differ you know, in different countries and based on their own unique context. So for example, you know, some of the other diseases we would have seen in our surveillance data that for some of the syndromes, we wouldn't have seen some of those information that we would usually be seeing because it is possible that, you know, some of this information has not been collected or because people were not going out to clinics to be to, to seek care for mild illness or mild symptoms. In many cases, you know, the health services would have prioritized persons for treatment based on their symptomology and based on the severity of their symptoms. So in some cases, I believe it would be, it would be fair to say that it has impacted on other diseases and other conditions, but the extent to which that has happened may differ based on the magnitude of the underground response in each country. Over. We're doing some musical chairs here. <laughs> um, uh, we have a question for Lisa, Dr. Indar. Has anyone, has anyone looked into virus strains of the virus in relation to persons tested in the Caribbean? Thank you, Angela. So no, that has, in terms of the strains and related, we do not have that types of data as yet. Um, so that is the short answer to that. Of course, and there's a lot of ongoing research, but we do not have any data on that as yet. Oh, understood. And while you're on the floor, are there any strategies employed within our region that has been that have been notably significant in gaining community compliance with preventative measures? Yes. So CMO Trinidad spoke of one, you know, the wearing of mask. Uh, and that has shown, you know, uh, from data in Dr. Lati's presentation as well, uh, where wearing of masks has been shown to be a preventative measure. Trinidad has actually legislated it. Uh, so this is one community intervention uh, that is working and that has been shown to work. Of course, the other measures of, uh, you know, the social distancing and um, hand hygiene. What is happening now with many of our countries is that, you know, they are, uh, creating um, more visibility for these public health intervention. Um, someone spoke about the use of Bujo Banton and others, but the more we do that and the more we get to our public and we expand it to others, we are seeing that where as people are educated, they would, uh, you know, that will help to improve their compliance. May I add something to that answer? Go ahead, Dr. St. John. So I think we need to also speak about the type of communication. I, I'm hoping that Carlon is here and she can speak to it. But I do believe that the regional health communications network in some of our non-English speaking countries have also done some translations of messaging into either 
Patois or some other local dialect. And that has also assisted with getting compliance. And of course, there is also the whole issue of when we see um, community leaders or even national leaders doing the things that are being taught by the ministries of health, that there is enhanced compliance as well. Yes, can Thank I comment you. on this one? Sure. Yeah, so we have we're having similar experience we um, in Guyana, where we have the national leaders and the um, the ministers are going out on the weekend, and that is look seem to be having an impact. And the other thing with the language, we have we had some the indigenous population, we have been able to translate some of the uh, messaging into four different uh, indigenous language in Guyana. So that's been uh, spread. We will see how that is going to work. So those are some of the strategies that. that that can work. Over. Yes, um, I don't think Carlin from our communications team is on. So I'll move on to the next question, which is for Dr. Parasram. Um, in your presentation, you spoke about de escalation pathway. And the, the writer found it quite instructive. And it, their question is, where did the tourism sector rank in the phases and how was the decision taken as to where it was best reintroduced? You would not believe. I just gave a whole question and I was muted. <laughs> and this question is for Dr. Parasra. On, on your presentation, you spoke on the de-escalation pathway. The writer finds that this was quite instructive and sequential. Their question is where did the tourism sector rank in the phases and how was the decision taken as to where it was best reintroduced? Um, Dr. Parasra? Uh, okay. Um, Maybe we move on. Uh, yes. yes. Angela, yes. Sure. Um, just a little bit on this question touches on something I think you just hinted to, Dr. Singh, and it's are there any strategies employed within our region? that has been notably significant in gaining community compliance with preventative measures? So for, for our, in our situation, they, we find the radio messages, the TV messages, and the use of the flyers. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the um, public figures are going out into the communities. There seems to be some traction in, in those areas to get people to change. The other one is the um, use of um, Making the um, the wearing of masks in public as as uh, if you now wearing um, as, as an offense, so that's people are complying with that with that measure, but we still have to uh, look for more um, enforcement. So that those are the, the ones that are actually working for now, um, and we see that it's getting more and more traction with the, with the public and changing in the behavior. Yeah, and, and, and to add to that, I mean, uh, uh, what Dr. Narin Singh is saying as well, um, and um, I know our comms department is, is here, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but one of the things that they have been working with is with through our regional um, health communications network is, you know, um, branding of the messaging for, for the different sectors. So what you would say, you know, the message you would say to the school, school children will be different than what you would say to the age. And how you say that message, you know, is going to be um, also important. So the different mediums 
um, to, for the messaging and how you would say it and what you use for the messaging, whether it be, you know, a, a, a star or, uh, you know, or, or, or a, a cartoon character and so on. So for instance, we are just developing um, a, a video that talks about uh, healthier, safer destinations and we use the, the cricket characters because you know, that's well known to the region. So people, you know, by be encouraged to be part of it. Yeah. To look at it and to, to participate. Hello. Hi. Sorry, I had some difficulty with my mic. Is it okay if I respond? Sure. Go ahead, Dr. Parasar. Yeah. So, so you were speaking about the, the insertion of the tourism sector. Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, we, we never had the closure of our hotels, um, or guest houses in any way. What we did do is, of course, we closed our restaurants and bars at the, in the early part of phase one to complete um, dining, um, in-house in dining, sorry, including, so we only allowed for takeout. Um, at that time in the guest houses, we would have allowed for room service, but no dining in the restaurants within those um, hotels, as well as there was somewhat of um, a closure of the public pools, which did close some of the pools and the hotels as well. Um, so there was not a complete closure of our guest houses or hotels at any point in time, but there was of course a decreased occupancy throughout because of the closure of our borders as well of, as the stay, stay at home orders were in place. And of course, um, dining was curtailed somewhat during the first and second phases. Thank you. Um, just one more. I think this would be Jamaica CMO has her hand up. Sorry, I'd like to acknowledge the CMO from Jamaica. Your hand is up. Oh, she doesn't have we um yeah, we'll asking our host to give permission to read up. Yes, hello. Yes, are you hearing you. me? Yes, we are. Go ahead. Okay, right. I, I just want to say thank you for the presentation. There were very good presentations. Um, I looked at the question that you'd asked about are there any strategies employed within our region that has been notably significant in gaining community compliance with preventative measures? And in Jamaica, I, I must say that um, certainly all the things that other persons have mentioned, the mask wearing, the increase in public awareness, um, hand hygiene messages, all of that has been helpful. However, I think that the community interventions that we have done have been significant in gaining um, compliance from persons. Um, we, in each of the community um, interventions that we have done, where we've placed large communities under quarantine, we have done surveys that have sought to find out why it is that persons um, are not compliant. And what we have found in those surveys is that certainly there's no lack of knowledge. Persons, we've been having our education campaigns from as early as January, and everybody knows about COVID, but a lot of people do not think it's relevant to them. It's not going to affect them. And this is what we have found consistently in the community surveys that we've done for the communities that have been under quarantine. So we have found that the community interventions have brought it home to the communities that it affects you. When we went, we, we had several community quarantines before we actually went into community transmission phase. And when we went into community transmission phase, we, we thought you know, that we would not have to do community quarantine anymore because now what was happening was right across the island and so therefore general measures applied. What we recognized, however, was that persons take their cue for actions based on what they see the Ministry of Health doing. 
And so when they did not see the community interventions happening, people kind of rested their hands down as well. And so we had to, when we saw that happening, we had to look at that and say, what it is that we need to do at this time to do more community interventions um, to keep the message alive. And we recognize that it was difficult now to employ our security forces to do full quarantine because there were just so many communities that were affected. And the community, the, the, the security forces were stretched to, to put a community under quarantine and to be placed in sentries at each entry and to be monitoring curfews and stuff. It was overwhelming. We, and also from the Ministry of Labor and Social Security to feed all the persons within those communities who would not be able to move around was overwhelming. So we, we went, we designed another type of community intervention where we didn't put the community full under quarantine, but we went back into the communities and we targeted all the, the different services, the businesses, the churches, the institutions, the homes, all of those, um, we had um, block meetings in communities. But once we started doing that again, people were saying that we didn't realize that we had positive persons in our community. We didn't think it applied to us still. And, you know, so the, the lack of knowledge is not, is not the issue, but, people don't believe it applies to them. And we found that the community interventions, us being out there in a targeted way, not just in a general way, but in these targeted interventions really helps with compliance. And the country takes it, its cues from us as a Ministry of Health. And if they don't see these interventions happening, they believe that everything is okay now. So I just wanted to mention that in terms of strategies that um, to, in to increase compliance that have worked in, you know, in our side of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that intervention and those words, very instructive to all of us here today. And again, points to a lot that what has been said before and gives us some guidance as how, how to go for, move move forward in our messaging, especially. Um, Dr. St. John, do you have, I'll be asking you for some final words. I was just going to say that some of the best questions are coming now we have to close. This is so pretty. <laughs> there is a question here. I want to just mention it. Is it possible to put together a document with what is working for COVID-19 prevention across the CARICOM member states. And um, this is from Lisa Ben. So I think, um, I think that it's time that we start to document because as I said uh, before, the chief medical officer at bone of this, and it's time that they start to document because it's not only going to help CARICOM, I suspect that in our tiny part of the world, we are doing things that can help other countries, big countries. So work with the chief medical officers and try to put together at least a report. And there is a question to Dr. Fletcher, um, maybe what we should do, I think we're gonna have to do things a little different with this. Um, this webinar, perhaps what we can do when we also post the webinar is to answer these questions we're able to take in at this time, um, because there's some really good questions here, because this question is, a, oh, clinical trials, <laughs> CARFA and clinical trials, I could say so much about that views of CARFA in recommending use of drugs like remdesivir, that remdesivir, lopinavir, um, interferon have just, there's just, um, a, that has come out from WHO and it was sent to the, the CARICOM Regional Steering Committee, um, which oversees the Caribbean arm of the WHO Solidarity Clinical Trials. So this is how come I have it because I'm on that 
steering committee. So there is a steering committee for the drug treatment trials. I am not aware of clinical trials for vaccine. Um, so that is involves CARFA, University of the West Indies, and the countries that have um, embarked on clinical trials. And like I said, remdesivir, lopinavir, so remdesivir interferon have just been proved ineffective by the solidarity clinical trial. I just want to say that I have been trying to um, not miss these COVID health rounds that the staff has been putting together and has um, in our CARICOM regional experts, like the expert chief medical officers who presented today. And this one has been really very important for me because I think that the way in which the Caribbean has managing this is a story that needs to be told. And I, I am so pleased to have heard that story told by our chief medical officers, even Dr. Bissasa McKenzie, during her answer just now has told us some wonderful stories. I want to thank all of the participants for staying on, even though we are past time. And I especially want presenters, the chief medical officers, the, the CARFA staff who have worked very hard on pulling this together. And I want to invite you to follow us and attend our other um, COVID health rounds. We um, will keep the information up to date on our website. And you can also look at our website for some very good um, information tools, guidelines, and infographics, which I think are also one of the secrets of making sure that the information is presented simply um, and in pictures so it's easy to visualize the ways that we can live safely with COVID-19. So on that note, I want to thank everyone and to wish everyone be safe, follow your protocols, and take care. Over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. St. John, for those words. I want to thank also again endorse what Dr. St. John said in terms of thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for staying to the end, even though we have basically gone past our time. I just want to ask you to please remember to fill out the evaluation form, which you will be getting the link as you leave. And also, we would like you to um, follow our Facebook. We have the recording of this webinar it will be uh, on our on our website just look for the link and we it's a youtube link and you can review and pass on to your colleagues who were not able to attend this really great session and according as dr st john also said follow us follow the other other uh, webinars that we have because it's truly interesting thank you very much and good evening to all be safe.